Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Eric Moller. I work in the core graphics department at Opera Software. I'm an old uh, game developer. I've been in the industry since 96, six, just up, up until I started uh, working for Opera a little over two years ago. Um, and uh, sorry, sorry. Um, what was I saying? One of the I spoke to Vincent uh, Scheib the other day, and one of the really we had a uh, discussed the backgrounds of the of the people that are here today. And Vincent did a little uh, um, poll on the internet that he tweeted about. Um, he only got about 40 replies, uh, but I think it was a really interesting question. So I want to I want to retweet it live and do a little show of hands the old-fashioned way. So the poll had backgrounds three categories for the backgrounds. Um, web develop traditional web developers, and traditional PC game developers, and traditional console game developers. So let's have a show of hands. Anyone who would consider themselves a traditional console web developer? Let me see. There should be about 10 of you. All right. What about traditional uh, PC game developers? OK, maybe twice as many and traditional web developers. All right, so that's clearly in majority. OK, so when I started working for um, Opera Software, the first thing I did was I wrote our WebSockets implementation. And shortly after that, I switched to the core graphics team. And uh, I've been working on hardware acceleration, and in particular, WebGL. So, when I started Opera, it didn't take me long to realize that I had this great opportunity to, to be part of making Opera and HTML5 a great uh, game development platform. And I'm really excited about being part of that. Um, so games in JavaScript. Uh, you know, I'm sad to say, but game developers traditionally haven't really thought that web developers are that cool. Um, you know, I know <laughs> I used to work at a game company where we had this one web developer, and we used to laugh at him because every now and then he pulled out this little old wooden ruler and measured a, a table on the screen or something like that. Um, you know, there's a, a totally different set of skills. Uh, we were assembly optimizing some inner loop or implementing progressive meshes or whatever was cool at that time, while that guy was you know, making table layouts and concatenating strings in JavaScript. And he was actually a really nice guy, but um, there's a, just a totally different set of skills. I think that's changed, though. I don't tease any web developers anymore, because HTML5 and JavaScript is just an awesome platform uh, to make games on. So I love the second browser war. It's called war, but it's, it's quite friendly between the browser vendors. Uh, a few years ago, there was this race to have the fastest JavaScript engine. We got V8, Charakhan, TraceMonkey. Every other month, there was a new leader. And of course, uh, 2010 was almost the year of the WebSocket. Let's not go there. Um, this year is definitely the year of hardware acceleration and WebGL. And what we're going to see in 2012, I don't know, maybe it's improved concurrency, audio, input. Let's hope for all of the above. When I talk to my um, friends from the gaming industry that implement native games, native app games, um, they're always concerned about JavaScript being slow. But Here's a screenshot from a uh, profiling session of Emberwind uh, running on an iPad 1. And as you can see, it really depends on what type of game you're making. Um, you can see the CPU is being used while loading, but when rendering, it's, it's barely touched. It's barely used at all. So you know, depending on the game, making games in JavaScript is definitely possible today. Of course, it's a different matter altogether uh, when I'm talking to some friends at Digital Illusions, you know, making AAA 
titles. Uh, they always aim to saturate both the GPU and CPU. You know, they even do, uh, on the CPU, they do like a low resolution uh, software rasterization to be able to do occlusion culling and not have to stress out the GPU that much. So whether we'll see AAA titles running in JavaScript anytime soon, I don't know. We'll see. So Emberwind was originally a game that I made after I sort of quit the games industry with some friends. Uh, we did it for Windows and OS X and later ported it to iOS. And it was a hobby indie project. And this summer, the VP of Opera Mobile walked up to me and said, wouldn't it be cool to make a HTML5 demo out of that game of yours? Of course, how do you say no to that smile? I couldn't. So that's what we did. We had three summer interns, and they were guided and assisted by me. And they just did a kick-ass job by porting that game. I'm very, very pleased with the results. So we wanted to test what's currently available cross-browser. And we also wanted to make it 100% flash-free, because we wanted pure HTML5. So why does Opera do this, a browser vendor? What's our interest in making a game, playing with games? Well, it's incredibly valuable to us to create content with our own technology. Just like a game developer would never dream of licensing a game engine uh, from a company that's never done a game with that engine. It also gives us a better idea of the current state of the browsers, not just our browser, but the other ones. It catches a lot of bugs early, and that really shortens the cycle when we found, find the bugs and we can fix them ourselves. And it gives us a good idea of what to optimize. Um, we have an internal bug tracking system at Opera, and there are just a ton of links to Emberwind in that. We need to fix this or optimize that. And I'm really pleased to see it come to use. We've uh, tested Emberwind on quite a number of platforms, uh, all the major desktop platforms, uh, all the major mobile platforms, and the one TV platform that I know of. I don't know, there might be more. I'm sorry if there are. So it is, of course, open source, and it's available on GitHub. You can go check it out. I encourage you to do that. Uh, it's nothing fantastic, uh, but it's a really good example of what you can make with HTML5. So I'm going to show you a demo of it. We'll run in a new tab. Let's see if we've got some audio. I'm just going to skip past this intro. So it's a cartoony little platformer. You play the character of a gnome watchman, and your job is to, to rescue the humans from the evil gremlins that are attacking you. So you're equipped with a cane, and you smack them over the head. It's loads of fun. Uh, I'm just going to play through a little bit of this, um, show you what it looks like. this. And I'm just going to follow the arrow up so I can show you the objective of the game. Okay. All right. So the objective of the game is there are houses scattered all across the level. You need to go there and find the villagers and light their fireplaces. And then when you've lit all the fireplaces, you go back out again, and you go back to your owl, you fly onto the next stage. There are boss battles, and unlocking lots and lots of moves. So it's a, it's a neat little platformer. OK. So when we 
did the port for Emberwind, um, we knew exactly what the requirements were because we had the existing game. So what we did was we created a render interface that did just what we needed. Uh, we wrote two backends for it, a Canvas 2D backend and a WebGL backend. Uh, as you can see at the top corner, it's currently running in WebGL. If I press a button, and it goes to 2D and back to WebGL again. It's really, it's really a seamless transition and interchangeable at runtime. And that makes it really easy to compare performance. Canvas 2D actually performs really well. Some things are inevitably going to be slower. If you see the little flashing arrow down there. Uh, the flexibility of a vertex shader and fragment shader means you can do that easily in, in WebGL, but in Canvas 2D, you have to render it to an off-screen buffer, so obviously there's going to be a performance hit on that. Okay. Because we wanted to uh, make Emberwind H, uh, flash free, we had to go with a slightly different approach for audio. The audio tag was never designed to deal with the 150 something sound effects that we have in Emberwind. So what we did was we used sound sprites. If you're not familiar how you do that, you take all the sound effects, you concatenate them into one long sound effect, you add a bit of silence in between just for good measures, and you output some information that you can use to seek to the right position and play that sound. And go back into the game. I can show you, we have eight audio tags or sound channels in here. I don't know if it shows on the screen, but um, if there's a little red marker, that means the channel is being used. So at the bottom, there's the, the audio track playing. And if I jump around, you can see how it allocates new sound channels, seeks to the right position, and plays that sound. And then it returns the sound channel again. It actually worked surprisingly well. You know, if your game isn't much more complicated than Emberwind, you could probably live with that solution. It doesn't work very well on mobile, though, but on desktop. There's a little sample uh, you can check out later. Of course, everyone is hoping for a cross-browser audio API next year, so let's keep our fingers crossed for that. Another thing we had to work with quite a bit was draw call reduction. If I go back to the game, I can show you, I turn on the FPS counter. So the second number you see there is the number of draw calls that are being done each frame. So in 2D Canvas, it's drawing about 88 draw calls per frame. If I press this button, I can actually step through the draw calls one by one. You can see how it's drawing back to front. And it's building up the gameplay layer one tile at a time. It's pretty inefficient. If we go to WebGL, you can see that the draw call count dropped to 34. If we do this again, you can see that almost the entire gameplay layer pops in at one draw call. And of course, the reason we could do that is because we're using texture atlases. So we're batching draw calls that belong to the same texture. So some lessons learned from Emberwind. Shut that down. You know, making a good game is incredibly hard. It really is. But as we discovered, porting an existing game to JavaScript was actually a breeze. I was surprised at how easy it was. We had three summer interns with no prior experience with JavaScript. Uh, I didn't have much prior experience either. And the only real issues we had to deal with were audio, some optimization, and some input. The rest was a breeze, actually. Time invested in tools for the rest of the team is always a good investment. I wrote a uh, pretty uh, cool editor for Emberwind, for the original game. Uh, it took me a fair amount of time, but when I had that done, I gave it to the guy I was working with, the designer. He went away for two weeks, and then he came back with almost a completed game. It was just a great experience. There are exceptions, of course. Uh, a good example of that is the particle effects in Emberwind. We had to do about 15 particle effects, and 
instead of writing an editor to do the particle effects, I sat down with the designer and he gave me some general instructions and I hand coded the particle effects. And it turned out that I could actually implement three particle effects from idea to fully integrated in the game per day. So in five days, I had all the particle effects done. And I'm pretty sure I would have spent a lot more time writing a particle effects editor. So have a think about that before you start making tools. OK. There's no secret formula for fun. You know, a, a really good game designer is going to have a better success rate than coming up with good game ideas. But you, you're not going to know if they're good until you've actually played them. And if they're not fun, you've got to be prepared to throw that away. And reduce draw calls and state changes. That's so important to get the performance up. And wherever you can get away with it, cheat. You know, all that matters is the end user experience, not how you get there. And what do I mean by that? Well, you know, spheres, they're awesome collision primitives. Who needs correct physics? If it feels right, it is right. And don't waste any cycles on real behavior and movement for characters that are off screen. If you need them to move towards the character, just teleport them. The players don't know about that, and it saves you a lot of performance. So if it's fun, it's right, even if it's a horrible, horrible hack. So going back to reducing draw calls. To reduce draw calls, you have to use texture atlases and batch draw calls. And I wanted to get an idea if that was a, a common thing you used in the web sphere, because I'm relatively new to this. So I went to our um, web developer at Opera and asked, uh, do you use texture atlases often? And he had no idea what I was talking about. So I started explaining, and two sentences into the explanation, he said, oh, you mean CSS sprites. So apparently, it is being used quite a bit in the web sphere as well. Uh, if you haven't used it before, I wrote a 200-line Python script to generate atlases using a KD tree. It's a really simple algorithm. It produces some pretty good results. It's open source, available on GitHub right now. I hope. There it is. OK. Here's an example of an atlas created. This is just all the images from one of my websites, uh, all crammed into one atlas. And the script I mentioned also generates an SVG animation that shows you how it builds the atlas. It's pretty fun to look at. So it starts with all the larger images and goes to the smaller ones. And it doesn't look right now, but it's actually going to be a pretty tight fit once it's finished. And it's just a really simple algorithm. Anyone can use that. Another advantage uh, to that, except for batching, is that quite often sprite sheets have a lot of empty space in them. Uh, this is a character from Emberwind, a uh, brownie. And you can see he's got some movement in his animations in the sprite sheets. So there's quite a bit of empty space. And the Atlas is also very good at packing that and saving uh, VRAM for you. Uh, the script outputs uh, some CSS if you want to use it in the DOM. And the goal of that CSS is to pull the little piece out of the atlas and make it behave as if it was the original image. Uh, it also outputs JSON if you want to do this in WebGL or Canvas. So here's a simple little sample usage using CSS. I'm not saying this is a very practical use, but it shows you how you can use it. So it pulls in the... Uh, the style sheet containing all the Atlas information. There's one div. It sets the class to one of the frames. I've put a border in just so you can see that it is actually displaying as the original image. And then there's a script tag that gets the element from the DOM. And every 20 seconds, it resets the class of the div. And you've got an animation. All right. Um, that was actually it for 
my Emberwind demo. Uh, now I'm going to talk to you a bit about a new demo that I've been working on. Uh, it's a WebGL 3D demo. I mainly did it because uh, I think it's really fun to work with WebGL, and I hope it's going to be something the WebGL community can take advantage of. Um, it's got animation and skinning. It's got shadow maps, light maps, normal maps. And if you've ever uh, tried to write a material class that handles, for example, the, the Fong material in Maya, you know there's just heaps and heaps of parameters you can set. So either you're stuck with unnecessarily setting parameters you're not using, or you're writing heaps and heaps of shaders. Uh, it's actually a, an explosion of shaders you have to write. Uh, I think before I did this little shader preprocessor, I had 60 shaders for just dealing with phone, the different versions of it. So let me show you. This is nothing advanced. If I input a define mat, that's an unlit material, it generates the vertex and the fragment shader for me. If I add another thing onto there, like diffuse texture, you can see I get a texture coordinate and some more uniforms, a sampler. So the source for that is, it looks a little bit messy. It's one uh, vertex shader and one fragment shader that sort of has the standard materials in it. You can see there's a if defs here, skinned material. Then it pulls in, you know, joint indices and vertex weights. Um, it looks a little bit messy, but it is a lot easier to maintain than the 60 versions of the shaders. So that's also in this demo. My goal is to have Colada source assets. Currently, it's using a Python script to convert the Colada asset into a runtime format that I use. But the plan is to allow this little library, or whatever we call it, to pull both the runtime format and the Colada source asset. And I want it to, at runtime, generate the runtime format. And the reason I want to do this is to make it easier for artists. You know, they can just export their Colada file and hit refresh, and it should all work. It's still a work in progress, but I have every intention of continuing this little project. I have a scene viewer as well. Everything is, of course, again, open source, available on GitHub. I really encourage you to go check it out. So let's have a look at a live demo. I'm going to need a little bit of sound for this. demo, and um, you've got the character you can move around. Uh, I think it looks pretty neat. Uh, it's got support for like standard materials, and you can write custom shaders. You can see the pillars on the side. It's a custom shader running. You've got cameras you can swap between. You know, it's, it's a nice looking little demo, and I hope it'll come to use to, to the WebGL community. So, I'm also going to show you, I have the scene viewer. It's nothing fancy, but I can load in the character. In this scene, he's, there, there are no lights in this scene, so he's going to be pretty dark. Load in the uh, walk animation. And I can switch cameras. If I just want to see the skeleton, I can disable meshes. Also go and load the space station. There it is. Well, it's. I think it's pretty cool. 
Uh, and like I said, I'm going to continue to work on this. Uh, so hopefully it'll come to use to, to someone somewhere. All right. That was the Odin demo. Seems like I'm flying through my presentation. So Opera has had this tagline, I think since the start of the company, when the company was founded, the best internet experience on any device. And the way we work at Opera, we have a core department that does all the, all the web technology, be it WebGL or Course or ECMAScript, you name it. Uh, and the core is uh, used by our customers, which are the platform teams, the desktop team, the mobile team, or the devices team. The devices team have a product that is called the Linux SDK. And that's being used to create browsers on TVs, I heard cars, apparently, um, maybe even refrigerators, who knows. And I wanted to uh, show you WebGL running in that product. Uh, I couldn't bring a 40-inch TV as carry-on luggage, so instead I brought a little development board. It's a set-top device. Uh, can we get that on screen, the demo? So here we go. This is a demo I made for uh, IBC earlier this year. It's a scaled-down version of, of the Odin demo. And this is, a, even if you, you can barely tell, it's, a, it's actually a browser running on a TV. It's rendering WebGL. Uh, I think we went a little nuts on the specularity. It looks like an oiled-up gladiator, but nevertheless, it's 36,000 triangles, multi-textured triangles, a skin character. I think that's pretty cool. So that's a whole new platform to, to make games for. Really excited about that. Okay, can I get my slides back? So, oh, I had a fallback. And a big shout out to the guys that are behind the scenes that managed to, after an hour, get that device to output something to the, to the screens. Great job, guys. Um, Yesterday, uh, Ken Russell and Ben Vanek did a great job at uh, talking about the performance um, of WebGL. I'm just going to mention a few things that might not be that obvious if, you, if you're on the other side of the API than I am. WebGL exposes some pretty handy primitives, line loops and triangle fans. They're great on OpenGL because it reduces the number of the vertices you need to send to the GPU. But they're not so great on Windows because all the browsers implement WebGL with a D3D9 or D3D10 backend. And of course, D3D doesn't support those primitives. So what we end up having to do is to do a rewrite behind the scenes. So we have to create a new buffer for you. And that's going to be a performance hit. WebGL also lets you specify vertex indices as U bytes. Again, it's great on OpenGL, reduces the data to send. It's not so great on Windows because all the browsers implement WebGL with D3D9 and D3D10. So we have to rewrite that for you. There's a lot of rewriting going on behind the scenes, actually. Um, WebGL also lets you specify all sorts of vertex formats. You know shorts and bytes and unsigned bytes, or even overlapping attributes. Again, it's great on OpenGL. It's not so great on D3D. So just you know, keep it simple and keep it aligned, and you'll be just fine. All right. That was actually everything I had. Um, Emberwind at GitHub. Go check it out. The Texture Atlas tool if you want to use it. Uh, Odin, that's going to get updated. Um, that's going to get updated uh, over the next couple of months. I'm going to continue working on that. Uh, you can find the slides at the bottom. And if you would just want to follow my work, uh, there's Twitter and my blog. All right. I think I've got plenty of time for questions, actually. So, anyone?
Uh, sorry, what was that? I don't know. Hello. Hi. All right. Um, well, on Maya, it, well, back up, sorry. Yep. On the conversion from the, the Maya skin weights, did you end up using multiple different skin weights for the, uh, uh, the weights themselves or one uniform skin weight map? Um, multiple skin weights per, <laughs> sorry, I didn't know. For, for, sorry, for the actual joints, you know, for the skin weights themselves. Did you end up using multiple different texture maps for transferring your skin weights, or did you do them like um, as just uh, the weights themselves? The weights British? themselves, yeah, they're they're um, brought into the unit by vector four uniform. Oh, okay. So I've got a max limit of, of four weights per per bone, but that's normally more than enough. Right. Okay. I was just confused in the fact that if you're actually using the image maps of some sort to transfer actually the, the weight values. No. Okay, that's it. All right, thanks. Yeah. Uh, have you looked into shader compositing as an alternative to the whole uh, pre-processing thing that you had going on? No, <laughs> that's the short answer. I haven't actually. All right, uh, that's just another alternative that's a little bit cleaner. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It, I thought it was a simple approach, but I'm sure there are better, better alternatives. Thank you. And by the way, I'm, I'm very open for suggestions on the GitHub project. You know, if anyone wants to file bugs on it or give me suggestions, I'm, I'm happy to oblige. Yes. Hey, super cool stuff. So um, how easy to use or difficult to use was your art asset pipeline you know, in the end? Well, uh, I, had a, I had a couple of issues with Colada initially. Um, the support is somewhat spotty if, unless you go with a uh, net allied plugin. The internal plugins in Maya and Max are actually not that good. Um, but um, exporting to Colada, then running a Python script, uh, and it's updated. So it's, it's quite easy, actually. Um, it'll be even easier when I get the, the runtime conversion in. So it's good. The Odin demo, are you doing the animation in JavaScript or uh, with shaders or in OpenGL? No, that's done in, in JavaScript at the moment. Okay. Uh, and the reason being that uh, some, of the, some of the devices like uh, set-top boxes can't handle too much stuff in the shaders. I'll make that an option later. Can you talk about, um, you had, I think, 36,000 triangles in that demo? Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what you think of, like, as a reasonable scene size for a WebGL kind of platform. On a device like that, or? Well, I guess, you know, you're designing your art pipeline, you have to think about the fact that you have a really broad range of stuff. Where would you kind of draw your lines? Yeah, there's a lot of difference in performance between the set-top boxes and uh, the set-top boxes are actually even worse than a mobile phone, I would say, in performance. So, um, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a hard question. Uh, I don't know if there is a, if there is a standard set-top box performance metric you can get. Okay, so, so leave the set-top boxes out. I mean, again, I'm just trying to think of, like, if you're designing, if you're saying to your art team, okay, you have to keep your scenes to 100,000, you know, is that too many? I don't think so, because, I mean, it depends on what you're targeting, but there's just a, a slim layer of JavaScript between you and the, and the driver. I mean, if you, if you can run it in native, there's really no reason why you couldn't do it in, in JavaScript. Cool. Thank you. Uh, would you be willing to talk a little bit about the tech specs of the set-top box? I would if I could. I have no idea. It's an Intel chip, um, I know. And uh, we ran out of uh, uh, uniforms quite quickly. And uh, I don't, sorry, I don't, I don't know what the specs are. It's called a, a Sodaville, if it rings a bell with anyone. Sodaville set-top box. I think it's Intel-based. Okay, cool. What approach did you take to convert all the, the 100,000 C++ lines of code? Was it brute, manual brute force labor, or did yeah, you develop was, some tools? No, it was manual. Um, 
we like the mandrel thing is fantastic. I think that's a, a great product. Uh, we just had the C++ source on one screen and we wrote the new source in JavaScript on another screen. And it was easy. It took us three interns. It took us two months to do the port of the game. And that's inexperienced uh, people. So. Ken again. So uh, when, will, when will Opera Mini have WebGL support? Opera Mini? <clears throat> or you mean Opera Mini and not Opera Mobile? Well, OK, either one. Either one. All right. Well, I, to be honest, I don't really know. The, I mean, the way it works, like I said, the, all the technology is made in core, and it eventually trickles down to, to the platform team. So it's going to be in the upcoming Opera 12 for desktop. It's already on, on the devices. Uh, so you have to figure out for yourself when it's going to be on mobile. Right. Is everyone? Okay. Thank you.